When you discuss the subject of unsung heroes, Group B is the kind of subgenre of racing and of motorsport which could easily come to mind, because of course Group B is notorious for having a lot of vehicles which arguably were cut down in their prime for various reasons, but predominantly safety related. They were getting so quick and so dangerous, in a similar way to some other forms of motorsport, but unlike some other forms, the crashes were becoming almost a guaranteed thing, and casualties were becoming a guaranteed thing. Of course, the Ford RS200 notoriously had a very, very bad crash, but unfortunately, and this is the part which isn't quite as talked about, it wasn't just Group B that died. Group S died along with it at the same time in the late 80s, and that is where this car comes in. Now, some of you guys have probably heard of this car before. You've definitely heard of the base model, of course, the Lancia Delta, even though to say that this is a Delta is about as loose as you could possibly get. That's kind of like saying that a stock car called the Chevy Impala has anything in common with the road-going Chevy Impala beyond the name. Of course, it's not. It's a purpose-built machine that just happens to share that kind of lineage. Now, this one's a little bit more akin to a Delta, but not by much. Of course, it's more specifically related to the Delta S4 Stradale, which is the ultra-rare mid-engine version with the two-door layout instead, kind of like a, a predecessor in a weird kind of way to stuff like the Renault Clio V6, which of course is more famous, but at the time, experimenting with hatchbacks with the engine in the back or in the middle instead was the done thing, and more often than not, it would turn out very well. The Peugeot 205, the Renault 5, this one. Now, of course, the Delta S4 in the Group B was a really good car, and the regular Delta, regular in a very broad sense, is an iconic car and a very successful one as well. This one, though, unfortunately never had the chance to shine. This is called the ECV-1, and that stands for Experimental Composite Vehicle, and of course, it was the first one they made. Now, there is also an ECV-2, which we might discuss in this series down the line. It's not exactly a looker. You probably wouldn't even know that it was a Lancia, unless you guessed. It looks more like a some kind of crazy Russian rally car, like a, a Lada or something. But we might discuss that one down the line. However, the reason why I'm bringing this car up is because not only is it pure badassery in its own right, and a failure, because it was never allowed to be a success, as simple as that, but this is a hero in a way that many people who even do know about the car might not realise, because of course Lancia was part of the Fiat group, along with certain other manufacturers like Alfa Romeo and Ferrari. And Fiat is a powerful brand with their fingers in many pies, researching various forms of motorsport-related tech which could be used potentially in the production world as well. Not necessarily in Fiat's, but potentially in Ferrari's or Alfa Romeo's. Now, on the subject of using this as a test bed, the technical name for the ECV1 is very interesting and it will perk up the ears of certain Alfa Romeo fans because this car is actually called, technically speaking, the Lancia SE041. Now, if you go forward in time just a little bit, that number sounds quite familiar. For instance, if you bump it forward a little bit to SE048, of course that is a very special Alfa Romeo Group C prototype, which never had the chance to see the light of day. So there's kind of a running theme here, unfortunately. But as far as this car goes, it has a smaller capacity engine than a regular five-door Delta would have. It's a 1.8 engine with a turbo aspiration, fairly obviously. And it's, to put simply, bonkers quick. It had 600 horsepower, and it was due to be homologated to about 300 horsepower for actual competition. Now, the car was tested, but never actually raced. And even stuff like the early versions, because the car did get more extreme as it progressed through testing, it got even lighter, for instance, it was quoted as being so quick that the human eye couldn't actually track it properly. And it would appear that the body of the car was stretching because it was moving past you so quickly. And the 0 to 60 times are estimated to be easily below two seconds. So, in other words, this car is about as quick as a modern day rallycross machine, except it did it 30 years ago, 
which is pretty awesome. <laughs> now that alone would be cool, and it would certainly be justified in being an unsung hero, because it's crazy quick, based on how good the Delta and the S4 already were, doubtless it would have been successful, to some degree at least. But there is even more to it than that, because the ECV-1 wasn't just this crazy powerful car that never had its day, which sounds very familiar compared to a lot of cars that we've talked about before. The fact that it was actually directly named after the whole purpose of its development and of its testing this experimental composite vehicle in particular, it wasn't just about how powerful it was or how quick it was in a straight line, it was about testing these alternative production methods, these composites like Kevlar and carbon fiber, to see how viable they would be given the expenses involved. Now in the case of this car, it weighed 930 kilos. And then later on, it went down to 910, and the wheels themselves were composite. They weighed only 6 kilos each. Again, this is the late 80s we're talking about. There was no Porsche Carrera GT or Zonda F, these kind of modern pioneers of carbon fiber supercars, kind of. This was way earlier than that. So the reason why I think this car is even more special than many people who have heard of it realize is not just because it's bonkers or it's quick or it's cool, but as well as those things, because they are true, it's much more important than that in terms of how special this car ultimately ended up being, even though many people didn't realise it, because, as I said, they wanted to ascertain not just how competitive it could be or how fast it could be, but the viability of these alternative composites. Now, I mentioned earlier, as I said, that Fiat owned Ferrari. This car in a very literal sense, led in one form or another to the first car, the first production car ever, to use a carbon fiber body. A car which would also happen to become the fastest production car ever made. The first car that's street legal and production to hit 200 miles per hour. The Ferrari F40. So, although many people don't realize it, the Lancia ECV1 is, in effect, the granddaddy of the Ferrari F40. So although it doesn't have that much in common on the surface of things, beyond being Italian and red, it actually has a whole lot in common. Turbo development, and of course the composite construction, both led in some way, maybe not an exact direct way, but definitely in a very influential way, to the justification of the Ferrari F40's construction, and look what a payoff it was. So ultimately, although the ECV1, it's not that it failed, it never even had the chance to succeed in the first place from a motorsport point of view, but it certainly wasn't in vain, because the car itself, as the prototype title implies, was as much a test bed as it was a competition machine, and I would say it was a success. An unsung success, but most definitely a success, given how iconic and how important, historically speaking, the F40 is. But that's it overall for this particular instalment. Of course, if you are new to this series and want to check out other weird and wacky cars, then you can click here on screen at the end to see all of the previous episodes. But for now, as always, thanks for watching.